YouTube. What's up? This is a video about my Sysmon modular project. I do get a lot of questions about how to use it, what the best configuration is, how to apply them and these kind of things. What I tend to see is that a lot of people just grab the generated configs that I publish, don't tune them a lot or at all and apply it in their environment, which gives them all kinds of blind spots, missed opportunities to get uh, more out of it. Hopefully this video explains a little bit more how to best apply your Sysmon configuration. I don't go into the full inner workings of Sysmon. There's plenty of other videos around or maybe I'll do something else. This is primarily how to apply the project, how to use it and how to get the most value out of it. So I got a workstation here, just a Windows 10 box. I do have Sysmon installed, so get service Sysmon. We can see it running. And if we look at the configuration uh, without typos, then we can see it's running. Uh, we can see its service name and we see the config file, which is basically the startup command line that I gave it when I installed it. So it, it only has the default configuration, which is very basic. There's no rules installed, so this is of course not what we want. In the event log, we do only get like the default. So, so you get the process creation event, termination event, and some, some other basic rules. It's not terrible, but it's definitely not great, right? So, so it's just very, very limited. We don't see that much. So let's do something about that. So this is also why I created my Sysmon repository. So this is the modular repo. It is a long list of directories. And basically there's a couple of files, which I'll highlight in a second. And of course, every self-respecting GitHub project has some documentation. Of course, it, it's called README and everybody does that, right? We all read the old documentation, but in, in most cases it actually makes sense to do so. There's a couple of things in here. There's of course a couple of pre-generated configurations, which is, as I mentioned in the, in the intro already, this is probably the most used of all the whole repo, which is a waste for a lot of reasons. Either one of them should be considered as a starting point, not as a go-to point. Every environment is different. You have stuff in your environment that I'm not aware of. And you might have different requirements than I initially thought out of. So with that said, there, there's a couple of like pre-generated ones that I still supply for the people that want to start with that. So there's a default one or the sysmon config.xml. And this is sort of balanced configuration. So what I do here is I tell sysmon to include certain things and I tell sysmon to exclude very noisy things. What you do get is a sort of tunnel vision approach of the things that I deemed interesting while building all of these configs. Of course, there will be blind spots there because I tell it what I really want to see and what I don't want to see. So there, there's only that bit. To work with that, there's a couple of other ones. And that depends a little bit on your ingestion appetite or your learning appetite or whatever, whatever your reason might be. So this is still a good config, but you should still work on it. Add your your own crown jewels to it or remove some stuff that you don't use so that you don't have additional blind spots. On top of that, what you can also do, depending on what you do with the logs, you can also work with the exclude only version. So that's the more verbose one. Basically what that version does is it logs everything except for the stuff that is configured not to be logged. And I'll show you how to do this in a second. There's another one, which is more intended for research, which is super verbose. It's basically logging everything. And this is tricky because well, logging everything takes a lot of CPU, it takes up disk IO, so it's it's gonna be hogging your machine quite a bit. But it can be useful in some cases if you really wanna know what can be visible with Sysmon for a specific technique that you're investigating, for instance. Usually what I do is I load this config right before I execute something and immediately swap back to a more convenient one or silent one. So I don't clog up my system the whole time. And the last but not least is a, a MDE augmentation config. Microsoft Defender for Endpoint is a great EDR, but it has some design choices that I not always agree with, but I can understand. What they do is they sample quite a lot of logs. One of which is for instance, the network connections where it shows you a first seen event per X amount of time. In some cases you might want to see more, for instance, when you want to see network beaconing or these kinds of thing. So this configuration is built to run next to Defender for Endpoint. So you don't have a lot of overlapping logs. There will be some, but that's generally intended or something that I prefer to have. 
And then there's, of course, some, some additional information. I, I do keep a couple of older versions, but I try to also keep track of all the new features. So at some point, the schema won't be supported by the older Sysmon versions anymore. And there is a lot of work done in the Sysmon community. Probably the best and, and most interesting repo that I've learned so much from is from Sysmon Security. They maintain a really, really nice documented set of base rules, and that's also their intention. They show you how to get started, and then from there you should build it out. Florian Roth forked that repository, and he's keeping it up to date with all kinds of new bleeding edge, uh, very proactive stuff. Definitely have a look at that. Of course, there's this one, and there's another one that that's the, the community guide from Trusted Sec, which is documented and created by Carlos Perez, and he gives you a lot of information on how Sysmon works, how to install it, even the, the Sysmon for Linux is highlighted there's a lot of information on all the event types uh, what they do how they're configurable the whole work so if you want to learn more about the inner workings of sysmon definitely uh, spend some time looking at this let's go back to uh, to the modular repo one of the first things we can do is we can basically grab it um, i'll write it to my uh, c tools and git clone and there we go once we're here i tend to fire up Visual Studio Code, simply because it's a nicer interface. I already set it up to look at the tool directory. And basically, once we look at this repository, one of the first things we can see is that whole directory structure, right? So there's there's like a zero to 26. At the current date, there's actually 28 Sysmon events. So there's also a file shredding and a PE download locker, which I didn't incorporate into the project yet, which will at some point definitely happen. I just didn't get around to do so. These are the configs that I talked about, right? So there's that exclude only, the MDE one and so on. And there's a PowerShell module, which we'll start using because we need to generate stuff. So the, everything is built up into building blocks to allow you to generate a configuration file like this, which is a very, very long XML file with a nice banner up front so that you can load that on a specific set of machines, either servers, workstations, developer stations, depends on how granular wanna want to make it. So one of the first things that we see is basically per event type a folder. And within a folder, there is a lot of XML files. I, I tend to sort of stack them together either by product or by intention or by something like that. And what you can see here is that you can tell Sysmon to include or exclude certain things. So exclude is of course, I don't wanna see it. Include is I do wanna see it. And then depending on how you wanna set it up, you can either tell it to only exclude stuff or you can do both within that config file for instance uh, the, let's pick the splunk one what splunk is doing is doing all kinds of activities to to grab logs of your machine so that it can transfer it to its central data store and of course all these actions also make noise so it's spawning all kinds of sub processes to gather these uh, events and so on so that's kind of annoying and it's kind of self-inflicting all kinds of data to itself so it's something that you might want to filter so that's why i created this this exclude config and what you can see here is a sort of very very minimal sysmon config module so i have a schema version here which is 4.3 currently we're way higher but i tend to use the lowest possible schema version for that function to still work so this is also backportable to an older sysmon version if you still have it that's why i don't keep that at the current bleeding edge level because i want to be flexible and what you can see there is a rule group and then the process create on match exclude so that is all also confirming that it's an exclude event and then you can tell it what you want to exclude so what you can see here is that I uh, block almost everything from the C program files Splunk bin directory, which of course also gives you some blind spots, but that's the intention, right? I don't want to see everything that Splunk is doing. And of course that also gives an attacker the opportunity to hide amongst it, but that's an accepted risk. So this is something where you have to be either very concise or you accept that you have some blind spots and you will pick them up whenever they do some process injection or some other methodology of lateral moving. You know what I mean? That's something that you have to consider. And on the include side, there is a similar configuration set so so basically what we do there is a little bit more but then we can also usually give it a name so in this case it's a very small one i'm only looking at bits admin process initiations and one of the things that the i add most of the time is, is a technique id so in this case it's the technique bits jobs which kind of relates to bits admin, right? And the technique ID. So basically I flag it with the most likely attack technique that is related to that 
specific binary or that specific file. And in, in, in this case, it's very direct, but in some other cases, there, there might be other things around, right? So, so the event viewer can be used to bypass user access control, UAC. Doesn't necessarily mean that it always is used for that. And it can be also used for something completely different. So it's the, the one that I deem most likely or the first thing that I would look for. So this technique mapping is definitely not the single source of truth nor is it the truth it, it it's just an option that you might consider well investigating this so don't see this as a direct attack or something else if it shows up in your logs nor is it the only way that it can be abused and moving on from there um, there is a bunch of other directories which are similarly structured the only different one is the the custom configuration one which sort of hence the name is where you want to put your additional configurations. A reason being that you can still be in track with the whole main repository. So if I get a pull request or I add some new modules, you can just pull them into your own fork of it, add your own custom configuration, and you can still be up to date with all of the other ones, which is kind of nice if you have multiple environments or you want to maintain multiple configurations while still being also in sync with uh, with what the rest of the community is, uh, is doing there. Within this folder, you can add as many XML files as you like. You can structure them as, as you like. That doesn't really matter a lot. There's also a couple of other files in here. So there's a couple of text files that are generated by the pipeline that I use within my, my Git repo. And basically what these files do is they give you a list of all of the modules that exclude stuff which can be useful later on. I also have a list of all the modules, which is basically like a long directory listing. It's nothing more than that. There's one for only file deletes, and there's one that is covered in Defender for Endpoint. So I use this basically to exclude all of these files while I'm generating uh, the, the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint augmentation config. So that's why they are there. But let's, let's get started uh, like in a basic way. So one of the first things that you do once you clone the configuration is you go, into uh, the directory, you load the PowerShell file, note the dot in front of it. That's just a way of loading your PowerShell script into uh, memory. And if you've done that correctly, you get a nice banner. And from there, we can start merging all of the files into a config. So one of the commands is to merge all XML as a string from the base path where we're already in that directory, but you can also give it a full path. If you would do this, then it will iterate over all directories, grab all the XML files, merge them together in a nice full sysmon config, which is an XML structure, and spit it out to you. Of course, you don't want that. So you might want to write that to a file. And basically, it will do the same thing. It will iterate over all the directories, and it will generate this file for us. So there we go. This is our XML file, and basically, this is the same file as we, we would see if we would generate it over here. Let's move on. So one of the things that we might want to do is now start customizing it. Maybe we have some stuff to add. We might want to have some additional functionality. We might want to build some additional modules. Let's create a new file. Let's prepend it with 17 for name pipe because we want to create a new name pipe configuration. And we want to include winsock.xml. All right, so we have an empty XML file. And one of the things I prepared uh, is a very small config that basically looks for a, a name pipe component. It's looking for the creation or the connection of a named pipe, which contains WinSock2, which is one of the techniques that you might want to investigate if you're looking at a, a remote POTAM attack. That's part of a, a COM attack. So it's a inter-process communication component object model attack. That's why I flagged it with this technique name. We can save that. And what we can do now is run that same command that we did before. So our sysmon yourtube.com.xml one, run it again. And it's basically going over the same directory structure, all of the XML files, and it's merging them together into one config. So now what we can do is basically have a look at uh, the file that we rendered and see if it's in there, right? So, so let's see if we can see WinSock. There we go. 
And there we are, right? So this is the one that we just added. So this is a way to add some additional stuff to your configuration that wasn't there in the first place. And this can be some new technique. And of course, if you want to do a pull request, I'm happy to look at it. I definitely welcome those. But also if you have some additional applications on your, or your network that aren't very common or custom built, or you want to flag something that is more secretive or not easy to share, this is how you can, can apply that, right? So you create all these files and the same goes for exclusions and for these kind of things. So it's a very simple way of creating a tuned configuration for your environment. And if you have multiple clients, you can do the same thing. You can do exclusions for client A, B, or C, and you can basically swap out these directories. Another thing that you can do, and this is where it gets a little bit more sophisticated, is customize it even more. So now there is all kinds of files in here. For instance, in the process creation one, there's all kinds of stuff that I exclude. Dropbox being a very noisy tool, uh, or at least the updater can be very noisy, spawning all kinds of sub processes. I don't want to see that, so that's why I create an exclusion for it. But let's say you don't use Dropbox in your environment. You might want to, or you probably do want to remove this exclusion from your sysmon configuration, because if you don't use Dropbox, then you won't have noise. So why would you exclude it? Because this is a black box bit that an attacker might know about or might not know about. But if they mimic Dropbox behavior, you want to catch them because you don't expect it to, to run in your machines anyway. What you can do then is basically create a text file here, which you can call whatever you like. I just called it YouTube and we can add some modules that we don't want in there. We already saw there is an exclude Dropbox in the process creation one. There also happens to be one in the network connection. So it's also creating network connections, of course, because it needs to sync. If you don't have this, this is also, a, again, an ideal opportunity for an attacker to install Dropbox in, and piggyback off, off the traffic, whatever. In that case, you do want to see it, so you don't want to filter it. So one of the things that we can do is basically we can uh, copy that from the exclude modules text file and we can put that into our YouTube folder. And there also was one on top here, which was called the exclude drop bar. Let's put that also here, save that. And now we have our additional filter list. So one of the things that you can do next is generate a new custom config, which is a similar command as we used before. So we still use the merge command. I built a, a copy pasteable version and basically what you need to do here is you need to be a little bit more exact. So within the base path, you have to define where it should start looking because this is important for the exclusion bit. So as you've so seen in the exclusion list, we added the directory structure in there, right? So which directory and which file is there. So if you don't include that base path properly, then it won't know where to exclude from because it's generating a list of all the XML files and they're differently formatted in that way. So that's why you need to have the full path in there. And the same goes for the exclusion list. So you tell it which file you want to exclude and where do you want to write it, right? So, so if we run this, what it will do, it will iterate again over all of the directories, grab all the XML files, including the one for the name pipe that we created, and it will subtract everything that is in this text file, which we created here. So it, it shouldn't add the exclusion for Dropbox on the network connection, nor the process creation event. So if all went well, we should have this new file, which is named YouTube. And if we look for Dropbox here, there shouldn't be anything there. And as you can see, there's no results. And to show you that it should have been there in the first place, you can look again over here. And we do see there is all kinds of Dropbox stuff, right? This is how it filtered it. And if we look at our custom YouTube config, we can still see that our WinSock2 file is still there. So this is, again, our even more refined version of our configuration, which we can also load and then we can have a look at it from there. So see, we called it the sysmon youtube.xml. So we can tell sysmon the dash C and then we tell it we want to load this. It's loading it perfectly. So as you can see, I tagged it with the 4.6 schema because it's they're yeah, basically the features I needed. And the current schema version is actually 4.83. So there's more possibilities that we could add later on. The configuration file is validated and it's updated. And as we would refresh this, we can actually get a lot of 
new event. So we do see already some image loads. We can see the process access events and all kinds of other things. So we have a config running now that actually logs way more than we want to do. And we can even output that from the command line if we want, right? So we can do C again we get the whole config that we just created as text, which isn't the most readable version. I prefer still, I, I, I'm not a huge XML lover, but this is a lot more verbose for me and easier to comprehend. It, it might look very daunting while it's, it's being this big, but keep on remembering that if you're interested in what it's actually doing, it's easier to just have a look at all of the modules that are available. And one of the things that I wanna urge you is if you wanna get started with this, just add the things that are important to you uh, that might not be in there. And also have a look at, uh, like I, ex I explained with the Dropbox example, if you don't really need it or don't run it, remove it because more visibility is usually a good way of helping an incident response person, but also a, th an, a detection engineer out in building better rules. So I hope that explains something for you. If you have questions, feel free to comment, feel free to tell me what I should explain more. Feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to answer questions. If you like it, definitely press the like button. If you want to see more of it, press the subscribe button. Thanks for looking and hope to see you next time.